Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. My name's Richard Brown, and I'm going to begin by talking about uh, bent grass selection, both with regards to uh, species and variety. And I'm also going to talk about the thought processes we would advocate you go through when uh, selecting the, the right choice for yourselves. I'll then be passing you on to my uh, colleague, Paul Morton, who will be talking about uh, overseeding uh, the best techniques and timings so that you can make sure you realize the attributes of these varieties. And finally, Sandy Pentecost will be talking about perennial ryegrasses for golf, uh, their applications, and it'll also be debunking some of the language surrounding perennial ryegrasses currently, which confuses both uh, greenkeepers and agronomists alike. I'd also like to say that any of you that are registered here, uh, what, what we'll do is we'll have a list of your uh, names at the end and you'll automatically be, uh, uh, your basis points will automatically be, be, be uh, sent to basis for you. So without further ado, what do I mean by modern bent grasses? Well, essentially I'm talking about, you know, any bent grass species or variety that meets the challenges which you face today. And as with all things in golf, back through the ages, it's all about power annua. It's all about choosing a variety and a species of bent grass that helps you to outcompete power annua on your greens. And why is that specifically important now? Because over the last five years, we all know we've lost a great deal of curative fungicides. And if you look at your green as a whole, then the less power you've got on that green, the less of the most susceptible grass you've got on that green, and the more of the favorable grass, these are the bent grass that you're managing on that green, the greater the disease resistance of the green as a whole is going to be, and therefore, and the great and the, the less the disease occurrence is going to be in the long term. So it's never been more important to reduce the amount of power on your green. So you want to be managing disease resistant cultivars and species of bent grass in order to not just maintain the status quo, but actually take power on and beat it. So it's no longer an aspiration to have more bent grass on your greens, it's an absolute necessity. So what do I mean by disease resistance? Well, essentially, as I see it, there's two types of disease resistance. There's direct resistance, and that's very much, you know, that's nice and easy to explain. That's essentially having one variety or one cultivar of, say, a brown top bent that is more resistant to disease. And when I say disease, I should say I'm specifically thinking of microdopium patch and anthracnose than the next variety. So, you know, just inherent varietal resistance to disease. And then there's indirect disease resistance. And what I mean by that is a variety that will thrive under conditions that power annua doesn't. So we all know that power annua likes to be fed. It likes moisture. And if you could be managing a variety or a species of bent grass that thrives under low nutrient, low management conditions, then you can begin to outcompete power annua, let the bent grass proliferate. And again, if we're thinking of that green as a whole, if you're managing on that basis, then as a whole, you'll be reducing the amount of power annua in your greens and you'll be making that green more disease resistant uh, by managing a greater percentage of bent grass. But of course, it's no good if the grass you've selected does all that, but it doesn't thrive under the modern stresses of the game. And when I'm talking about modern stresses of the game, I'm thinking particularly mowing height. So if we move on to our first candidate, first species to discuss, we'll think in brown top bent. Brown top bent, the, the choice for UK greenkeepers, you, the, 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 the grass which many of you will be uh, managing currently, and it, a, a, variety, a species that has worked traditionally in the past and still does to a larger extent today. We all know about brown top bent. We all know that we can establish brown top bent in our greens. We can get communities of brown top bent in there, which act as fire breaks against the power and ostensibly work to uh, stop disease, it, does it get, if you get fusarium in your power, the fusarium goes through the power and then when it hits the brown top bent, it stops. And that's the, the point to try to in, integrate these grasses into your green. We all know that brown top bent is rhizomatous. So it spreads by slender rhizomes. So the rhizome goes under the ground and comes up to produce another plant. And we all know that given time, these communities can spread. 
But that's my point on brown top bents, really, I think, given time. Brown top bent will spread and can take on power annua. But what we would say is if you're, but it doesn't do that as rapidly as the next species I'll talk about, creeping bent. So what we're saying when you've got a brown top bent and you're managing brown top bent in your greens, it's never been more important for that brown top bent to be very resistant to fusarium, the most resistant variety you can be managing. Because if you imagine you've got those communities established, you want the power to suffer. You want it to touch those patches of brown top bent and you want that disease to stop. You want that island of brown top bent to remain as large as it was so that it can then proliferate and grow so you're starting to win the battle rather than constantly maintaining that status quo. So therefore, when we are selecting brown top bents to bring to the UK market, our number one driver currently is resistance to fusarium because we think that is the number one driver to meet the challenges that you face today. Uh, we could talk about our Aberregal and Aberall varieties, which are UK bred and have an inherent disease resistance, but we haven't got lo loads of time today. So if you talk to a technical rep about that, we can talk to you about that. But I just wanted to highlight our newest variety of brown top bent musket, which we introduced last year. Now, if you look at the uh, chart here, this is the uh, information from the 2016 close moan trials at the BSPB. Now, this is not publicly available information, therefore I can't list all the other varieties on there. But the point of this chart is where my predocium patch is present on those trials, it is scored. And you can see here that musket has a high score of 6.8 for resistance to my predocium patch. There are also other varieties on there that do very well, but there are some that don't. And the point I'm making here that is that fusarium resistance is a varietal trait. It is not true to say, well, any old brown top bent will do me, any old brown top bent is the same as the next. That's not true. It's true to say that if you manage to convert your entire green to any old brown top bent, that would be better than having power in there. But of course, you know, we, we, uh, we, we can't do that overnight. So if you're trying to advance the amount of brown top bent you, you're putting in there, you need a disease resistant variety. The other great thing about musket, the other reason we chose it, and this has a link towards uh, disease resistance, is it has a very early spring growth. So it gets away very quickly. It's very uh, cold active. And because it gets away so quickly, it's a hardened off plant quicker, which gives it that great resistance to disease. So I could see you're all sitting there thinking, well, that's it, you, you've solved it for us then. We, we, uh, we manage disease resistant brown top bents. We starve the power out uh, and, uh, and we let it get disease and, and then things proliferate. Well, that would be great, but, and there's always a but, but before I share that but with you, I'm going to ask you a question. I think I'm going to ask you a question by finding a poll. Here we go. I'm going to ask you a question now. I'm going to, in a minute, a poll will flip up on your screen. Now, don't worry, no one else can see your answers, but there's a question here about your height of cut. If you choose the most appropriate answer for you, and then that will inform the next part of the talk. Here we go. So you should see the poll now. If you all put your answers in there. Flicking about. There we go. I think we've got a good I think I'm, I'm, I think I'm sharing the results there. So we're straight away looking there and we're seeing that, you know, a larger percentage of you than I thought are, are, managed, are only mowing down to four mil, but the, 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 as, a, as large a percentage of 3.5 to four mil. And then some of you are down, you know, lower than three and a half mil and sometimes lower than three mil. Well, this brings me on to my point with brown top bents. I can move the screen along. There we go. We just got the mowing heights back through history there, 1990, 3.25 to 4 mil. My point with brown top bents is if we are being brutally honest with ourselves, we say in our catalogue that our brown top bent blend of a majesty will tolerate mowing down to 3 mil. Yes, it will tolerate mowing down to 3 mil. 
certainly tolerate mowing at three and a half mil. But what we think is, or what we know is, that it won't proliferate at those heights. So if you, once, you, once you're starting to mow south of three and a half mil, brown top bent will not proliferate, it will not spread as quickly, and it will not tolerate that height and relish it as much as the next species we're going to talk about. So we're on to creeping bent. Now creeping bents, you will all know, has a, prost, a, a very lateral growth habit. It spreads by stolons rather than rhizomes, so runners along, along the surface of the ground. It's, uh, it, it spreads by stolons, it's got that more, a more aggressive habit there. Um, and its ability to spread laterally and outcompete power annua is, and do it quicker is well known. And if we quickly look, but if I can hear you all sitting there thinking, well, yeah, all right, Richard, you've said that, and we know that, but don't creeping bent grasses need higher nitrogen? Don't they need more water? Doesn't that mean that in order to manage creeping bent grasses, I'm going to have to increase my inputs? And by the way, doesn't it mean that in actual fact, I'm going to have to increase all these and at the same time encourage poannua, which is directly the opposite to what you've already been saying? Well, yes, that's exactly true of older creeping bent grass varieties. And this is the point we need to make about new creeping bent grass varieties that uh, Germal has been pushing over the last four or five years, namely 007 and our new variety Tor Pro GDE. These new varieties are a completely different beast. And if we just look at the history of breeding there quickly, with you know, by no means complete, but this is a potted history of creeping bent grass, well, it, we, you'll all be familiar with Pencross, 70 years old now, but probably the first big commercially available creeping bent. And then the, what you might call the second generation after that, Pen Eagles and Pen Lynx, and the third generation in, uh, released in the early 2000s, the Pen A4s. What these varieties all had in common was they were all bred specifically to take ever lower cutting heights. But that's fine because the game then was to produce a fantastic surface, keep on top of your agronomy, look out for disease, and as soon as you spotted that disease, there was a can for that. Well, we all know that those days are over, but the good news is these new varieties of creeping bent address those problems and they address the challenges that you face today. And I'll explain that by looking at the current, you know, the, the, uh, the thought processes and the breeding that went into these varieties. So when what informed the breeding of these new generations, so back in the late 90s, as they begun, began to think about introducing these varieties, Rutgers University, the largest bentgrass breeding program in America and, uh, and the world, identified that 70% of all fungicides applied to golf greens was for the prevention of, or not the prevention, for the curative nature of microdopium patch and anthracnose. And so they set out to breed varieties that were, had a far greater genetic um, uh, diversity so that they could resist stresses uh, such as drought stress, etc., And at the same time, by resisting those stresses, it meant they were able to subsist on lower inputs, N and moisture specifically. Now, the great thing about breeding varieties that, um, that tolerate greater stresses was that of course, this made them very commercially viable in that they could uh, persist and do well in all the weather uh, climates you'd find around America. Now, if they persist and do well in all the weather climates you find in America, that essentially means they persist and do well in all the climates you uh, find around the world. And this is true of these varieties, and you'll see varieties specifically 007, uh, it's slightly older than, than Tor Pro, being used from Morocco right through to Siberia. It's the choice for the, uh, for the uh, to, well, what is now the 2021 Olympic course in Japan. So these, these species do well all around the world. But at the same time, their, their inputs are reducing. So these varieties are doing far better and able to subsist on typically between 70 and 120 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per annum which I think you'll all know is coming within the range of what you'll be using in the UK. Uh, so essentially with the new modern creeping bents, what you're getting is you're getting 
all the traits that you wanted from the old cruising vents, that aggressive lateral growth, but you're getting it, you're having your cake and eating it, you're getting it for lower input. So you can continue managing in the way you currently do without changing anything, and you can take advantage of these attributes. And if we look at the picture on the top left here, you've got an older variety of creeping bent grass declaration on the left, and you've got 007 on the right. And you can see that extra aggressive lateral growth, but also you can see how it's gonna tolerate that lower mowing height. So it's gonna do all of this, it's gonna tolerate that lower mowing height, and it's gonna proliferate and help you to outcompete per annua. But at the same time, you're not gonna to have to feed it and feed your way into trouble. And at the bottom there, you've got a similar picture, which shows an older variety of creeping bent there, and it's been mown there at three mil, and you can see that scalping, whereas on the left, you've got uh, 007, and it's not got that scalping. So it's tolerating that three mil height, and it's proliferating. And so, like I say, if you can manage these grasses and uh, let them proliferate across your green, then as a whole, we're going back to that, taking the green as a whole, your green will be more disease resistant because you're out competing per annua. But don't just take my word for it. I've told you all that. But who am I? Uh, I'd just like to draw your attention to a study here done by Christian M. Baldwin at Mississippi State University. Now, essentially what Christian did was he took many commercially available varieties of creeping bent grass and he applied nitrogen at 49 kilos per hectare, 147 kilos per hectare and 294 kilos per, he per hectare. And he applied them weekly between April and October. So and then he saw what the effects were. Well, essentially, what he identified was that the agronomic trait of making a viable quality putting surface at the lower end rates, 49 kilos, was very specifically varietal. And he picked out two varieties there, particularly 007 and Sharp, new modern varieties. But this wasn't true of any old creeping bent. And so again, what the point we're making here is, what we're not saying, and what it's not true to say is, that we're re-rolling back the years and saying that choosing any old creeping bent and bringing it and putting it on your greens is going to solve all your problems. No, very definitely not. Picking the right modern advanced variety of creeping bent is the way to go. And we're definitely seeing in the marketplace, you know, again, any old creeping bent, me too varieties coming through, even some 70 year old varieties that have been formally named. That's not the solution to your problems. The solution to your problems is taking advantage of all those attributes with a variety that can, that can thrive on the lower rates that you want to use in order to outcompete per annua. So going back to its suitability for the UK, we've already talked about these new varieties such as Tor Pro and 007 being tolerant of stresses and uh, climates all around the world. Therefore, you know, it's suitable for the UK and We've got examples from the very north of Scotland there, right down to a well-known course down in the south of England, where 007, these modern creeping bent grasses, are doing very well. We know that they can survive at the inputs that you want to put in, and we've got guys managing these on anywhere between uh, 60 and 120 kilos of N, and generally bringing those N rates down in order to try and starve the power out. We are very sure that they can uh, take the heights of cut that you are mowing at. So if you do want to reduce that height of cut, you've got a grass in there that's, uh, that's working with you. And we know that if you're out competing per annua, then you, the disease resistance of your green as a whole is improving. And we also know from the BSPB list that these varieties do well here, because we see there that 007 is second on the list in the, creeping bent, the current creeping bent last list. And Tor Pro, the new variety, is a new cultivar this year, but we'll go on to top that list. So, you know, there's evidence there that these Creeping bents are suitable for the UK, are becoming ever more suitable because they now match the management that you want to, uh, to put in. So you can use them either alongside, uh, you can either sow them into existing brown top bent swords or you can sow them with brown top bent and manage them in the same way and they can complement the brown top bent in your greens. And the, the other point I'd like to make about creeping bent and why now, why have they come on now is that it's no surprise really that this is, I've heard it said to be, so people say, oh, creeping bent, this is just something you're, you're talking about and it's just a, a little trend that you've got going. And of course, you know, this, this happens in the seed trade, things come and things go. Well, no, not on this occasion. 
it's no surprise that briefing events are advancing and are answering your problems because if we look at the market as a whole uh, we look at the largest breeding program in the world which is at Rutgers University they are concentrating mainly on creeping bents although they are improving some brown top bents and the market in the world just generally the, the creeping bent grass market would be six to seven times greater in tonnage than that of the brown top bent market so it's true to say that there is less effort being spent on the improvement of brown top bent than there is on the improvement of creeping bent therefore it's very likely that creeping bent is the species going forward which is probably going to answer some of the questions we've got so as a country to sort of close our doors on that and say well we don't do creeping bent of course dried hot bent what we do i think uh, would be remiss of us and we'd be losing the opportunity of uh, taking advantage of a, a, a species there that we should be taking note of so finally, just before I pass you on to Paul Morton and almost as a prelude to uh, Paul's talk, um, we uh, talk about increasing the amount of, brown, of, of bent grass in your greens and we call that preventative overseeding. You've probably heard that, that expression and, and read it in our catalogue. Well, if you're going to try and increase the amount of bent grass in your greens, you're probably going to have to overseed slightly more and Paul will talk about that later. But I just wanted to draw your, and that probably means you're going to have to overseed at times other than the traditional window uh, of, uh, of, of, of late summer. I just wanted to draw your attention to this study done by the American Society of Agronomy and Science back down very recently, 2019, where they essentially took 21 commercially available varieties of creeping bent grass and they uh, germinated them at suboptimal a, 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 a array of temperatures which worked out as a, at an ambient air temperature of 4.4 degrees centigrade, 7 degrees centigrade, 9 degrees centigrade and 15.5 degrees centigrade. And what they found was, not surprisingly, at 4.4 degrees centigrade germination was very poor. But at 7 degrees centigrade, and that, you know, an average ambient air temperature of 7 degrees centigrade, 50% of most, most varieties germinated in 12 to 15 days. Some were better than others. So you look at poor old Memorial didn't do very well. Decoration did exceptionally well, although unfortunately it's an older variety, so it wouldn't take your mowing height. But some of the newer varieties such as 007, you can see there, you're getting 50% germination in 12 to 15 days. So it is, and if we look at the average ambient air temperature of in the UK back in 2019, in March, it was 8.9 degrees centigrade in uh in it, that was in 2019 in 2018 admittedly it was 4.9 degrees centigrade and in 2017 it was 8.5 degrees centigrade so what you're saying is in two out of the last three springs not to, to discounting 2020 it you would have got good germination of bent grass in your greens in march so it's possible to start thinking outside the box in terms of so, sowing times in order to get ahead of the game and increase the amount of bent grass in your greens. So I hope that made sense. I'll now pass you on to Paul Morton. Thanks Richard, I'll uh, just take in, uh, control. Hopefully this will run a bit, run smoothly. There we go, I've approved that. Uh, just bear with me a second. Right, yeah, I've got it now. So thank you, thank you, Richard. Um, yeah, hello, my name's Paul Morton. I'm the sales advisor for the, the Northwest. So uh, today I'll carry on Richard's talk and I'll be touching on overseeding methods, rates and, uh, and timing, which is probably most important. Um, just a bit of housekeeping at the start. Obviously at Germinal, we are advisors just as much as we are salesmen. So. Um, we won't recommend overseeding programs if we don't think conditions are not conducive, i.e. Uh, if you've got thatch issues, etc. Yeah, we want to see the results just as, as much as you guys. Um, something I've certainly been preaching over the last few years with the, uh, the amount of restrictions and whatnot, and this has taken out of what's happened in the last 12 months, you know, what we need to do is disassociate the overseeding with the dreaded renovation week. Um, more than ever now, we, uh, in my opinion, it needs to be part of your maintenance. Uh, certainly shouldn't always just be a renovation task. 
like Richard mentioned about where we're going with chemicals in the future. Um, yeah, you need to be having more and more bites of that cherry. You know, when, when we are actively overseeding, it's not an intrusive procedure. It's, it's not detrimental. And by all means, it's not only successful in, in the back end late in the summer. Uh, we, we don't need to be proceeding our, our works with heavy scarification or heavy jumbo tines to, to make a seed bed. And it doesn't need to be incorporated with 100 tonne of sand at that time. Um, as we all know, you know, you will get the best germination uh, in the back end. Um, certainly quicker germination in the spring, but what we've found and through our studies and certainly um, a lot of other studies around the world is the, the actual mortality or, 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 or the, the death rates are much higher at that back end. Um, and all, all, these, all these reasons why are, are, are much uh, more prevalent at that time. Yeah, obviously your hide a cut's much lower. You've got stress from heat and, and traffic. And um, again, we are mentioning, if we're doing our renovations, we're putting all that sand on at the same time. Uh, there's, there's a lot of golf courses and people I visit who just have said to me over the years, yeah, overseeding is a waste of time. It just doesn't work. And it's, I think it's because you're lumping it all together with all those, those stresses as well. Um, a big one, which I think has come in, in the last few years, probably a big part of this is social media. You know, we, we, we're too quickly to judge our overseeding, I think, after a couple of weeks. You know, we, we, we want to take those photos um, of the seed and beautiful lines and we'll post them and people will say, well done, great job. And then we walk away, you know, we think, yeah, overseeding has been successful. Um, but you don't really see your best results till probably the following spring. About now, you know, um, you can pop out and, uh, and have a look at your greens this time of year when everything is different colors. You know, you can really see how successful it is. You know, and I've had guys posting me photos this week of the overseeding from last August, September, you know, still in line, still in the dimple, still coming through in the seed. That's successful overseeding, um, which goes to say, you know, we need to take advantage of these, these other sowing times. Um, again, if we have a disease outbreak just prior to your overseeding or just after your overseeding, um, and we're, we're not planning any more seeding for 12 months, you know, all that's going to grow back in those gaps afterwards is, is, is metagrass. So the cycle just continues and continues. So here's, here's a good example recently. Um, obviously, a, a, a take all patch is broken out. Um, you can see from the vertical lines that some overseeding had been done about six weeks prior. Um, and it goes to show, you know, fresh, healthy seed uh, is almost disease resistant. Obviously, the metagrass is, is being attacked by that. Um, but what, what this golf course has now got in place um, is that just a week prior to my visit and taking this picture, he'd gone that way with some overseeding. So he's having a double hit on that um, and, and you have two lots of seedlings coming through. Um, and by, by now I'd say that disease patch and a few of the others would be pretty much taken over with, with, with the bent grass. So it's, it's good forward planning. Um, Richard briefly touched on cold seeding and again, it's, Pertinent this time of year. Um, I think cold seeding can be lumped right through to, I guess, when almost summertime, really. You know, just it's basically when we're putting seed in the ground that we aren't going to get ex instant results from. You know, we're not trying to repair scars or things like that. We're just building up a seed bank. Um, so, again, lots of studies out there. We've done our own trials and studies in the Northwest, I have as well. Um, and what we found, you know, that the seed obviously comes through slower, but it, when it's growing slower, uh, it comes through a bit hardier as well. Uh, and, and there's no disturbance. And you, you, when it's coming through, you know, we're only mowing it once or twice, uh, well, even a month this time of year, you know, um, and, and the plant is just much more mature and, and, and ready for, for anything we can, we can hammer it with. Um, so yeah, I, th I think um, the, the, the big thing we don't get is, is uh, those luminous, green lines that we all love. So I think the confidence um, in doing it isn't always there, but it, the seed doesn't need to be mechanically sown in, in lines. If the seeds in the soil, regardless of how it's in there, it will germinate. It just, it just comes through at different times. 
when it's not in a consistent depth. But yeah, like I mentioned before, it will come through. Um, yeah, a, a big one is the weather. Uh, obviously, this past January was, was awful. And as a salesman, like I mentioned like my first point, I, I did talk a couple of guys out of it. I said, you know, there's, there's no point. You know, we had probably 20 days when snow was down. And when it wasn't snowing, we had record rain levels. So yeah, it, 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 this January wasn't ideal. Um, the other thing as well, when you're choosing which species to use, brown tops or creek and vents, um, are, are probably the, um, the, the only option here. Um, they, they do have a natural resistance to, to condition to the weather and, and soil, so they will sit happily for months. You, the biggest seeds, your fescues and, and your rye grasses, you know, they, they, they need to be buried mechanically deep, which sort of does slow down the germination. And also if they do germinate s slightly and then the weather turns again, they will, for lack of a better word, rot off a little bit. Um, so this, this is the picture, it's, sorry, I, I apologize for a little bit blurry, but this was a golf course in the Northwest. Uh, last, last winter, cold seeding, seed went down and germinated in January. You know, so um, he, he does it religiously every year, gets fantastic results. And his, his feedback to me is doing the seeding and spreading out all his work, he, he, that for him has reduced his disease. You know, he said he hasn't seen anthracnose for two or three years since he started spreading his, his work out. So the little and often approach. Yeah, so again, no argument from anyone. The summer, autumn is, you're gonna get your best um, germination times, um, but also means you should take advantage of more than one time. Um, and it's about spreading out your applications you're broadening the, the success, but you also are minimizing the loss. You know, you, if, if you can afford 100 kilos of bent grass a year, you don't put it all down at once, spread that out. Um, yeah, of course, we're going to sound like salesmen saying those figures, but you can look at the other end of it as well. Creeping bent can be sowed as low as one to two grams. Richard mentioned the Olympic course in Japan. They converted their greens over a three to four year period from an older species to 007 by putting it as low as one gram per square meter seven or eight times a year. Um, I know that's time consuming. Um, uh, brown top, yeah, like Richard said, it, it, it doesn't proliferate naturally. So you do need to go slightly higher. Um, you can put anywhere up to 70 to 100 kilos per annum with creeping bent, like I said, 30 to 50 kilos is, is, is a good number. Um, Briefly there on fescues, um, yeah, you, you do need a, a hell of a lot more seed for those and also they have a, a much shorter window um, of, of, of their peak growing time as well, mainly sort of towards the back end. Yeah, briefly on the methods, I think um, disc seeding is probably probably the most popular. Um, like I said, it gives you those, those um, visual results you can see. It is very simple. You can either do it yourself, get a contractor in, they, they dial it in, take off and away they go. Um, it, is, it is probably just dis more disruptive uh, over other methods. Um, seedlings can stay in, in, in the tram lines, um, and, sorry, and cause tram lines, which some members do moan about, especially if we are seeding with a disc seeder in the height of summer and it does dry out. You know, I've, I've seen seed being able to you know, sort of pull out almost like a, a, in a line. Um, dimple seeding is, in my opinion, has slightly better results in the sense, you know, you are spreading that seed out. Um, you're getting more natural spread, um, but with brown tops and especially some of the older machines, you, you can be putting far too many seedlings in each individual pot. So you do get a bit of melting out. Um, looking at the chosen method um, of, of many of the big courses around the world, you know, they, they don't want to put, be putting tractors on their green. So you'd be surprised to hear that you know, a lot of these courses, even with unlimited budgets, are, are utilizing a drop spreader, even a cyclone spreader. Um, as long as you've disrupted that surface in any way where it's grayed in, uh, sorry, not gray, a groomer, um, a sorrel roll, a microtone, anything just to break open that surface, drop the seed over at your preferred rates. Um, yeah, it, it, it works. You're getting seed to soil contact. I, I mentioned before, you know, you don't have that visual success. 
but that's what we're here for. You know, we, we can come out and hold your hand and show you, get down on hands and knees and see those results the following spring. So that's pretty much it for me. Um, we'll have a few questions at the end. I'll, um, I'll now pass you on to Sandy, who will take over. Great, thank you, Paul. Uh, I think I've got control. Let's have a look. You have, yeah. There we go. Okay. Uh, my name is Sandy Pentecost. I'm based down in the southeast. And this afternoon, I shall be talking to you about perennial ryegrass. So let's start with some history. So immediately type ryegrasses first became available um, back in the early 1960s in USA. And what they would have been from would have been from failed agricultural types. And the characteristics that they ideally were trying to achieve at that stage would have been shorter, more dense uh, stands of turf. Now, the first variety is Lin NK 100, 100 offered poor quality attributes across the board. And they offered poor mow quality, and they needed a lot of nutrients and water. And also, they would have been really quite poor for heat and cold stress as well. So fast forward to 1968, um, when the Manhattan arrived, it was considered the first true landmark ryegrass. And um, this was bred by a chap called uh, Dr. Reed Funk, who outside of having an excellent name, um, was also a renowned um, plant breeder, well-renowned plant breeder, bred many different grass plants. Interestingly, um, Reed Funk was a mentor to Dr. Hurley. Uh, Dr. Richard Hurley went on to breed 007. So um, there's a good um, pedigree and lineage there. So under the direction of um, Dr. Reed Funk, Rutgers went on to breed a handful more varieties. And um, I think uh, breeding was also underway in Penn State University at the same time. Well, meanwhile, over in Europe, breeding programs were initiated in the early 70s. These would have been in the Netherlands and Germany. So we have jumped forward to the 1990s where um, these rye grasses, I mean, the types were given the title of dwarf perennial rye. And that was to differentiate them between what I mentioned earlier, the failed agricultural types. And any of the rye grasses that you're offered today, um, that they're, they're basically fall under the banner of dwarf perennial rye grass. So British seed houses um, really pushed this terminology with the arrival of Abba, Elf and Imp in the late 90s. Um, Aberimp was actually the first um, variety to top both list and turf grass booklet. And um, Aber Elf and Imp were actually really good, um, really good plants, but they didn't yield very well. Had they yield well, they'd still be around today. So let's um, explore some modern terms. So dwarf rye, which I've already mentioned, and um, creeping rye came available about 10 years ago, um, and it creeps by throwing um, down to terminate stolons, um, much more popular in winter sports, um, ultrafine, which I'll come on to in a moment, and then there's tetraploid. So everything I've mentioned before, tetraploid is a diploid ryegrass. Now the difference being is the tetraploid has twice as many chromosomes. And also, the way I like to think of it is um, diploid ryegrasses have a tighter cell space and um, that's the way, way they are, and they're, they're basically more wear tolerant because they're more smaller and robust and compact. Whereas a tetraploid has twice, you know, twice as many cells per chromosome, chromosomes per cell, sorry, and they're larger cell structures. They hold a lot more water. And that's where their shortcomings um, are really because tetraploids aren't as wear tolerant. And if we look at the Sports S1 table and the Sports S1S tetraploid table, which is actually an extension of the Sports S1 table, and so it's basically a direct comparison between the two. If we examine shoot density, you can see that the, you know, the numbers are quite disparate. And this is what it's demonstrating is basically the, um, the tetraploids aren't very wear tolerant. Tetraploids will actually come out, get out of the ground quicker in colder conditions. So they do have an advantage there. But beyond that, there is another reason why tetraploid, is, you'll find it in um, a lot of uh, ryegrass bags nowadays is because tetraploid yields very highly. So from a commercial point of view, if you're a grower or a producer, 
you can produce a lot more seed at a lower cost and actually change charge the same amount as um, diploid within the same bag. But there's no doubt in my mind in any of those mixtures that the diploids are doing the heavy lifting in terms of wear tolerance. So why has rye become so popular? It's become popular because fast germination establishment, it's robust and versatile, and there's a reliable return on investment. People are very confident using it. You know, it really does do what it says on the tin and people can get really quick results, especially with the demands, modern demands put on green keepers and turf managers. They want to get a quick, quick result. And outside of that, I think it just fits in with the modern psyche of, you know, we're used to getting everything quick now. And that just seems to be the modern way of life. So let's move down now to ultrafine, which I mentioned earlier on. So ultrafine was a term created by Germinal. Um, this was created when um, we got Cabrio and we put it into trials of the STRI. What we noticed about it is its fineness of leaf. It's fineness of leaf 8.6. And we also already had es Escapade and Escapade's fineness of leaf is eight as a score of eight. So putting those two together, we saw how fine leaf they were and we come up with the um, term ultrafine. So what these um, ultrafines are is they're finer leaf late types. And what that means is that they come to seed later in the season. Now the downside of that, because they come to seed later in the season, they don't produce as, as much seed. They don't yield as well. Whereas the broader leaf early types um, or the winter types, they come to seed earlier and produce a lot more. The difference being is that the finer leaf late types command a higher price in the market. And as you can, as you probably assume, the broader lead early types are actually more cheaper or cost effective because they produce a lot more seed. So in terms of applications, these are golf tees, surrounds, um, lots used on fairways over the last few years. Some of it owing to the drought of 2018 and even the mini drought of 20, well, 2020 down in the southeast and also um, to, for leather jacket um, damage remediation. They're also used in cricket and tennis. So Cabrio is the finest lead and ranked number one. We're very proud of that. It's top of the BSPB um, table L1. So let's have a look at the table. So there's Cabrio at the top, the finest leaf of 8.6 and its partner in the bag of A5. Um, Escapade down there for the finest leaf of eight. So I think it's fair to say that, you know, anything with a score of eight above is a true ultra fine. And you could easily include um, Bar Olympic in that too. And um, what it's worth bearing in mind is even just because a bag says ultra fine on it, it doesn't necessarily mean they're, you know, ultra fine varieties within the bag. Um, it might be just the finest um, type of ryegrass that that vendor has to offer. So it's, a, you know, often good to get your hands on the BSPV turf grass booklet and examine what is an ultra fine. Because what ideally you don't want is to, find that you know you you bought a bag that says ultra fine or very fine and it's actually got early winter types and in and, and you don't want to put those into fur, uh, fine turf situations because you run into problems when you start to lower um, mowing heights so let's have a look at um cabrio so in the picture there you've got a chewings on the left and cabrio on the right um, and you, you can see it's very fine leafed. What it's worth noting actually from the Cabrio picture is the, the main stem and where it throws out its first leaf. So by nature, I mean this plant's probably one and a half, two inches long, it's at the leaf stage. So by nature, it doesn't want to throw out, you know, that, that first leaf until it gets to that point. I don't know where it was on here, it might be 10, 12 mil. So that's when you run into problems when you start reducing mowing heights because then you're putting that plant under under unnatural pressure, basically. So on the right, we look at the picture. There's a picture of A5, which is 50% Cabrio, 50% Escapade. And, um, and from that picture, I think it's 20 mil. And uh, as you can see, it's um, quite fine leafed. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, greens. Um, picture there on the left, that is about 95% um, Cabrio and Escapade. It's on a chipping green, so that's a really good situation to use that in because it's a high wear area, not necessarily going to be used for putting, maybe a little bit, but even so, it's still a reasonable surface. And what's good about that is if we look at the, the 
G4 Greens table um, down at the bottom there, all trials are carried out between four and seven mil. And this fit, you know, six mil fits us that perfectly. And you can look at that picture and see that, you know, the ride grass is perfectly happy. So when you get to below, below those heights, you start to run into some issues, really. It can be used below those heights for a firefighting purpose. So you've got um, poor cover on a green and you need to get some cover until other plants colonize around it. Um, yeah, it's brilliant as a nursery plant, but has its limitations um, in greens. Um, and I'm gonna go, come into those now. So it needs a higher water requirement, um, which basically pose it, plays into the hands of Pyrrhenia. Um, it needs a higher nutrient demand, which also plays into Pyrrhenia. And it can still get disease. You know, it can get anthracnose, fusarium, um, red threads, quite common in ryegrass, that still can get disease. And another thing to consider is growth rate. Um, you could run into some surface issues. Now, I appreciate, you know, a lot of guys are using PGRs anyway. Um, but if you're cutting the green at 6 a.m. in the morning and by 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the growth rate is quite strong of a ryegrass. And it's by nature, it wants to grow upright. So you could run into some surface trueness issues there and you know it's a problem you could leave it out um, and then there's also the practicalities of incorporation because there's no you know no proliferation where I grass is essentially just sticking lots of plants in pots um, so you, even if you're trying to get it into your greens you're going to make wholesale changes very slowly because it doesn't proliferate like bent grass would you get these wonderful you know sort of legions of rye which are pretty much going to stay where they are and beyond that, there's, you know, when you really deal, drill, drill down into it, there's um, no cost benefit over bent grass. So seeds per gram equivalent, uh, one kilo of bent grass is equivalent to about 13, 14 kilos of ryegrass. A 13, 14 kilos of ryegrass is going to cost you in the region of 70 pounds, where a kilo of bent grass is going to cost you around about 20 pounds or around about 38 pounds for a creeping bent grass. So in terms of cost, there is no no true benefit. So all of those are really worth you know something bearing in mind and considering those before you think about using ryegrass um, in your golf greens. Anyway, that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, I hope you found that useful. I'm going to pass you back to Richard now for questions. Okay, I'll take control of the screen. Um, I forgot to say this at the beginning, but any questions, if you'd like to, if you haven't already, we'll deal with questions at the end, which of course we're where we are now. Um, if you just type the questions into the Q&A box and we'll, we'll come to those uh, as and when we've got them. Well, I've... Hang on, I'll look there. I've got one question here that's come up and it's talking about, doesn't creeping bent grass go dormant in the winter? Well, again, I think this is an issue with older creeping bent grass varieties, but very definitely that is this is not the case with newer varieties. Again, that that increased genetic diversity. I think if, again, if we I keep saying 007, we look at 007, it's got 24 parent plants in its in its uh, in its in its parentage. Uh, these new varieties are far more cold active than the old varieties, and they suffer far less from the purple discoloration you used to get. So you, that is. A difference with new creeping bent grass varieties that they, they don't go dormant in the winter they don't get that that uh, that, that winter dormancy and i think really you, you'd have to speak to people who have used them but that's very definitely the, the case and uh, and the breeder dr hurley has dealt with courses all around the world including uh, courses in this country where you know they they haven't had uh, dormancy issues with creeping bent so i think that's you know, again if that's a that's a that's typical of older varieties but definitely not typical of the new varieties, but it does just go to show that you're not just using any old creeping bent. You've got to make sure you're using one of the new generation creeping bents. We got another question here. It essentially says, you know, isn't it still the truth that over sowing in the summer is still the best time for germination of bent grasses? Well, yes, that is, True, it's definitely true that you know if you oversow when you've got high soil temperatures, you are going to get greater germination. But as Paul said, 
you've got germination is only a small part of establishment. I mean, if you take germination as a given, it's going to germinate if you brought it from a reputable source. But if you then out, if you then weigh it up against the different mortalities it's going to get, so it may be that if you're oversowing uh, in the autumn, you've got greater pressure of play, etc. Whereas if you're oversowing in the spring, you've got less less uh, less um, uh, pressure from play there. So where where you're losing seedlings in the in the uh, in the in the autumn through pressure of play, you're and you're losing some in the spring through lack of germination because of temperatures, but you're still get you're still gaining about the same across the board and worth a point I perhaps ought to have made when I made my point about creation vents. The other thing is, you know, with Paul said, with, with just over sowing after minimal soil disturb, uh, disturbance all through the summer, well again, you might decide, well I can overseed right in the middle of play, right in the middle of the summer in June, July, and while those temperatures are very high, you, you've got inhibited germination of power species at that time, so again you're taking advantage, you, so you're going to have greater less competition for power at that time of year but of course what you're doing is you're over sowing when you're mowing at a very low mowing height but of course if you're using a creeping bent grass then that's going to come through and it's going to proliferate more readily at those very low mowing heights so again you're taking advantage of your a different species to mean that you can over sow at a time of year where you wouldn't normally do normally be able to do that so you're just you're just accepting limitations of each different time of the year but what you are doing is you are constantly keeping up the battle and you are putting more and more troops into battle against power annua in order to win that battle rather than just you know, maintain the status quo and stick where you are do you think the new ultrafine rye is fine for cricket pitches absolutely yes i mean this is it i mean i think you know the, the lower the crown of a rye grass then you know you, that should be being used for cricket and this is it I mean when I started in the tr sea trade only 15 years ago our standard mixture for wickets then was actually uh, a little bit of ryegrass with some bents and fescues in and then just ryegrasses have just progressed to the point where they are much lower much more dwarf so they've got those lower crowns and they've just come on in leaps and bounds so whereas a uh, you know ryegrass in nine in 2005 was much better than a ryegrass in 1995. These new ultrafine ryegrasses are even better. So, so perfect for cricket wickets, absolutely. Well, I think unless there's any more questions, that is, that, that's, that's us done. So thank you very much. As I say, you will get your basis points awarded automatically because we have a list of who's attended and we'll send that list of bases for you. Um, I think I have one more slide there just to finish. But thank you for attending this afternoon. If you've got any questions, please just pick up the phone and talk to your area technical sales representative. And uh, we'd love to talk to you. Thank you very much. Richard, Richard just before you go, there's, there's a, another question. Oh, two more questions. Here we go. Yes, yeah, I, I can answer that one if you like. Okay, yeah, um, go on. Yes, basically he's asked if um, uh, he's got power that has taken over his greens more and more. And he's, he's, he's had advisors have um, stopped the overseeding um, to slow down the organic buildup. Um, yeah, I think <clears throat> I think certainly uh, overseeding is not adding to the organic buildup. I think it's, it's always tricky, like I mentioned right at the start of my talk, if, if it's not conducive to overseeding, but if you are undertaking quite a vigorous or aggressive removal of that thatch, whenever you are opening up that surface, there's no harm in putting the seed in. Maybe you're not going to blow your budget and use creeping bent, um, but obviously a bit of brown top. And the simple mathematics of it is, you know, you do quite often hear uh, the statistics or like, what's the point of overseeding if I'm going to rip it out? Well, unless you're scarifying with the most aggressive coral or graden at you know, 13 mil and, and, and 13 mil spaces, sorry, you'll only ever be taking maximum five, six percent of that surface out. And within that, how much of that is going to be new seedling? So I, I wouldn't stop overseeding, just may, maybe just be a bit more careful with the budget and why you're trying to re remove that organic matter. But no, it's certainly, it's certainly not going to harm. Yeah, so hopefully that, that makes sense here. Yeah. Okay, well, I think that's, uh, there's no more questions coming in now. So that's the end of the presentation.
thank you all for attending and uh, we'll hope to see you all very soon.